Welcome to the Unit 7 Genetics video review. We're going to go through all of the information I think you need to know for this unit and kind of sum it up for you. So let's get started. So what is genetics? Genetics is that field of biology understanding how characteristics are passed from parent to offspring. So it can be called heredity sometimes, um, but for the most part we'll refer to it as genetics here. When we talk about genetics, we have to start with a man by the name of Gregor Mendel. In the 19th century, he studied heredity, which was that transmission of characteristics from one to the other. He was an Austrian monk, and while he was in the monastery, he started looking at pea plants, and he started to grow them and play around with them and see their characteristics and that kind of thing. Um, what he did is he studied what he called his factors, so and it kind of described the pea plants, so whether they were tall or short, whether their seeds were green or yellow, things of that kind of nature is what he was looking at. Um, here we can see a bunch of the different factors that he investigated. Um, flower color, flower position, seed color, and so on. And basically what he did is he started to grow these plants out. What he determined was is that he could create a true breeding strand of that plant, which meant that if it was a purple flowered plant and he crossbred it with some with itself it would only produce purple flowers so he tried to isolate the factors out that way into the little plants and that allowed him to do some cross color experiments and things of that nature so if he took two opposite true breeding plants so for in this sample we're looking at flower color if he had a purple flower plant and a white flower plant and he crossed them together. He wanted to see what would happen. So he had a true breeding purple, which meant it only produced purple flowers, and a true breeding white, which meant it only produced white flowers. Okay? He called his first one, the original parents, the P generation. So we can say the P kind of stood for a parent. Next came the F1 generation, and the F1 generation is the first offspring generation. Okay? All of the offspring in this case were purple. So what he determined was is that purple color in flowers was the dominant color over white, which means that if it had a dominant factor, it would show that. So the purple was the dominant factor, the flowers would be purple. Okay, so then if he had a dominant one, he also considered that there had to be a recessive one, and that would have been the white color. Okay. Next, he crossed those F1 generations, and he made that, he called it the F2 generation. When he did this, he was kind of surprised initially, and what he saw was that about three out of four flowers were going to be purple, and then the other plant would have white flowers in it. So that was about a three-to-one ratio, and this kind of caught him by surprise, and it started to make him think a little bit more, which is always good in science. So here we can kind of see just a quick example. We have our P1 generation, which is here, and we noticed that we had a purple and a white. When we crossed them, we ended up with all purple flowers. And then when we took these all purple flowers of the F1 generation, these ones here, and crossed them, then what we noticed is that we had some purple flowers and some white flowers. Now, keep in mind that Mendel knew nothing about Punnett squares, which we're going to talk about in a second, or genes, alleles, or even the DNA. All he was doing is observing the phenotypes, what they look like, and record the ratios and other statistics. And this, by doing this over enough, gave him the ability to come up with two really important laws as a result of his experiment, and we still use these laws today. Those laws are what we call the law of segregation. Okay? And what he said is that each plant is going to get two factors for a characteristic when the plant reproduces. Okay? One from each parent, and that's kind of important. So it's going to get a factor from the mama plant and a factor from the daddy plant. Okay? So each characteristic that that has. So for flower color, it's going to get one factor from the mother and one factor from the father. And we can see this in Punnett squares. Down here is where you'll see an example of a Punnett square. And what we're talking about is, if this is my female parent up here, notice that she has two factors. And we're going to use theirs. Okay, Our term now instead of factors is the allele. And notice she has a capital T and a lowercase t. Capital T is a factor for a tall plant. The lowercase t is going to be for a short plant. Those two factors are going to separate out, and it goes down that way. So each child, we look at this one, this child's getting a tall factor from the mother and a tall factor from the father. So we can see how those two alleles are going to separate, and they come in together, and that's really important to understand. Now, 
Mendel did experiments using more than one trait, okay, and he noticed that one trait didn't influence the other. So if he was crossing flower color and, say, seed shape, they didn't affect each other. And that was really kind of in other words. So what that meant is that gave him the ability to say that different factors separate independently. They weren't attached. They weren't combined. So he could try and breed a flower or a plant in the way that he wanted it to because he could pick for each of those different factors. And this we see comes out of meiosis. If we're taking a look here, we can kind of go through the process. From prophase here, we go down to metaphase, and you can see how they line up, and then it separates out. And we can see on this case that we have two reds, two blues. Here we have a red and a blue and a red and a blue. So they can separate out independently. They're not attached, and that's kind of a neat thing. Okay, now, independent assortment, which is what we call this, so that each of the factors can be sorted independently, doesn't always happen, okay? And that's key to happen. It, it got lucky for Mendel. It worked out nicely. But if the genes are on the same chromosome, then what's going to happen? They're going to stick together unless, like we saw last week, if we have crossing over. Okay, so if we have crossing over, they might separate independently. But for the most part, if it's on the same chromosome, they're going to travel together. And that's what we call a linked gene because it's on the same chromosome. So... Now that we understand Mendel and his factors, what really are they? Well, we know today that these are the alleles. And our alleles are quite simply the different forms of a gene. So if we have a gene for flower color, it has two alleles. One is purple and one is white. Okay? So the characteristics like height were all caused by these genes on this DNA, which we've recently discovered, and now we know that there's DNA and all that stuff. Okay? So genes are a piece of the DNA that codes for that one protein, and that one protein is what determines that physical appearance. Okay? And each of your genes has two alleles. You got one from your mother and one from your father. So why do alleles come in pairs? Because chromosomes come in pairs. They're the homologous pairs that we talked about during mitosis and meiosis. There's one allele on each chromosome, so it kind of shows out. You got one chromosome from your mother, one chromosome for your father, so you're going to have one allele from your mother and one allele from your father. Okay, so let's go through some vocabulary real quickly with you. Um, we have a dominant trait. The dominant trait masks the recessive, which means that if the dominant trait is present, that's what we see. And this we often use as a capital letter. So when we're doing our Punnett squares, if you see a capital letter, that's going to be the dominant trait. Now, we also have the recessive trait. The recessive trait can only be seen if there's not a dominant trait there. Okay? So that's the lowercase letters. All right? And the only time we'll see those is if all we have are lowercase levels, letters. If we add an uppercase letter, then that would show us the dominant trait. Okay? We also have a couple other words like phenotype. Phenotype starts off with that pH. That's going to be the physical representation. That's what we see. That's what you see on the outside. Okay, so a purple flower would be a phenotype. We also have genotype. Genotype is going to be that genetic makeup. So what alleles does it have? Typically, this is what the letters represent. Okay. So genotypes usually two letters, and why are they two letters again? Because we have two different alleles, one from the mother and one from the father. So that's why we always see them in pairs written out that way. Now when we're talking about genotype, we can talk about two other special words. We can talk homozygous and heterozygous. Homozygous, homo means the same, so that's going to mean it has two of the same alleles. Heterozygous, hetero means different, so that's going to have two different alleles. So in our examples, a capital H and a capital H, they're the same, it's homozygous. If I had a capital H and a lowercase h, then they're different, that's going to be heterozygous. Okay, homozygous dominant, two big letters. Heterozygous is going to be different, so it's going to be one capital and one lowercase letter. And homozygous recessive means that there's two lowercase or two little letters. If an organism shows the dominant trait, it can be either heterozygous because it has a dominant allele or homozygous dominant because it has two dominant alleles. The only time you'll see the recessive is if it's homozygous recessive. Okay, so now that we've gone through and we've learned a little bit of this stuff, let's kind of take a look at this stuff and see what's going on. Um, 
when Mendel talked about his true breeding, what we know now is that he had a homozygous condition for that allele. So if it was always going to produce purple flowers, then it would always have, like that capital F, capital F for purple. So the only allele it could give away would be what? A capital F. So it always produced purple flowers. Okay? And the same is true with the white ones. It would have lowercase f, lowercase f. It would be homozygous. So what we've also discovered is that we can show these observed results using a Punnett square. And a Punnett square shows all the possible genetic combinations of the zygotes, of the babies. Okay, so if we take a look here, Mendel crosses true breeding purple and white power plants, we write this as a purple homozygous dominant, capital F, capital F, crossing with a homozygous recessive, a white, and that would be a little lowercase f and a lowercase f. Okay, so here we go again. Here's our parents. Okay, we have our true breeding purple and our true breeding white. Now, they're going to break into gametes. So that means that they can give away one allele. So what are the possible ways I can break these apart? Notice I can have a capital F from this one, or I can give it this capital F. So it's going to be a capital F or a capital F is all. And the same is true with our white flower here. We can give it a lowercase f or a lowercase f as well. Okay. So now let's plug it into our Punnett square. So here we have our parents. And remember, our parents each have two alleles, so we're going to have to separate out those different alleles. So we'll put a capital F down here and our other capital F there. Okay? And with our white flower, we'll put our lowercase f here and our lowercase f there. It doesn't really make a difference where you place the parents. Um, some people will tell you it needs to be a certain way. It just makes sure that one's on the side and the other's on the top. And then what we do is we fill it in. Okay, the first thing we're going to fill in is our capital letters. So our capital letters are going to go horizontally here, just like you see me filling it in that way. Okay, and that's just by convention. We put the dominant in one first. And then we'll fill in our lowercase letters down here. And you can see how they fill down. They're just simply filling in the chart. And we notice that all of our kid, all of the offspring, are going to be right here. An uppercase F and a lowercase F, and that gives us our purple flowers. And we know that because they're different, it's a heterozygous condition. Okay, so we can fill it in again. You can kind of see it here. Done. All right. Sometimes we're going to be asked to predict things. So what we'll do is we'll count the number of squares that match it and divide it by the total number of squares, and that gives us what our percentage is. Okay? So in our case here, what we had is we had all four of the four possibles were this uppercase, lowercase, heterozygous condition. So that means that 100% of the offspring are going to be that way. Okay, and that's when we're talking about just making our predictions. Okay, what Mendel didn't know is that all of the F1 plants were heterozygous. They were different. And that's why they were all purple. They were purple because that purple color is dominant to the white color. But they were also heterozygous. So what happened was is when he crossed them again, that's why he was surprised to see the white come back out. Okay? can show this. So here we had it. Notice all of our parents in this one were going to be this heterozygous condition. So their uppercase was one choice that they could give away as an allele, and then the lowercase f was their other allele that they could give away. Okay, and then if we fill in our, our Punnett square just like we did last time, we'll fill in the capital F here and the capital F here going across, and then we have a capital F coming down here, and then we have another lowercase here. And what we notice when we're done is that we have, genotypically speaking, we have a purple flower here, okay, which would be homozygous. We have our homozygous recessive white flower there, and then we still have two of these heterozygous purple flowers. So just looking at flower color, we're going to have one, two, three of them would be purple. So three divided by four is 0.75 or 75%. And one-fourth of them, or 25%, would be a white flower. Okay, so that's the way we set it up as. We've kind of gone through this one. Phenotypic means how many to how many, and that's where we get our three to one. We always start off with dominant first, so purple, two, white, three, two, one. Okay, and our F genotypic ratio in the F2 generation, that's where it's going to be a little different. If we fill in our Punnett square real quickly, we remember that this one here was homozygous dominant, and this one here was heterozygous as well. 
So we're going to set up our genotypic ratio to kind of match this pattern here. So we have one homozygous dominant to two heterozygous to one homozygous recessive, and that's where we get our one to two to one ratios. Okay, so remember the genotypic ratio is one to two to one because we can see what alleles they have. The phenotypic ratio is what we saw, and we only saw three purples and one white, so it would be a three to one. Okay, so sometimes they're going to be a little different that way. Okay, sometimes we get a little more complex and we use what we call two traits, a dihybrid cross. So if we were going to do that, we would take a look at, say, tall, two heterozygous, tall, heterozygous purple flower pea plants. So we're looking at the two traits, tall and then purple, okay? And the opposite of those would be what? Short and white, okay? So this now, we're looking at two different traits, and we're going to plug two different traits into our Punnett square and see what we get. So what possible combinations can we come up with here? So again, we look at this, and we look at our tall, and our tall has two different conditions. It can be our first trait for height. We'll go that way. We can have a tall one, which goes here, okay? Or we can have a short one, which goes there. And the same is true with our flower color. With our flower color, we can have purple, which would go here, or we can have white, which is going to go around here. So you can kind of see that we have to split it up. The easiest way is we'll take our first trait, this tall, and we have two different conditions. So it can be either tall or it can be short. But for each of the talls, it can have two choices. So it can either be tall and purple, or it can be tall and white. And it can be short and purple, or short and white. And that way we get one, two, three, four different combinations. So we'll plug these four different combinations into our Punnett square like this, and then we fill it out the same way. Okay, start with your first trait, all of the capitals. So I'll fill in my capital T's going down this way, my capital T's going down this way, my capital T's going this way, my capital T's going this way. And then I fill in the remainder of my T's. Okay, so then I'll fill in my lowercase T's, lowercase T's, lowercase T's, and lowercase T's. And then I do the same thing with my uppercase F for the purple flowers. Out that we end up with our Punnett square completed is the one that you see here in the corner. And then we'll have our phenotypic ratio. Okay, and our phenotypic ratio is going to be a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Okay, so purple and tall, purple and white, short and purple, and white and short is going to be how it's going to work out that way. Okay. So it kind of sets up just like these ratios are set up here. This is what we're talking about here. Now this is phenotypic. Okay, phenotypic means what? We're looking at the, what we see. Okay, so nine of the plants are going to be tall and purple. Three of the plants are going to be tall and white. Three of the plants are going to be short and purple. And one of the plants will be short and white. And that's how we get our ratios. Okay, now... Mendel was kind of lucky. He was looking at monogenic traits, which means none of them were linked, none of them shared anything. Each trait was independent of the others. It was really easy. They were really simple to define. One gene kind of worked it out. Nothing too complex. In life, we know that things aren't always that simple. So we have different kinds of dominance and different kinds of inheritance. And the first one I want to go with you is incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance is where the phenotype of the heterozygous is kind of a mix, okay? Complete dominance means that if it has a dominant allele, it shows up. Incomplete means it's kind of a blend between the two, and probably the best example is comes in like carnation color. So I can have a red flower, and I can cross it with a white flower. Red is going to be the dominant condition. White is going to be the recessive condition in, per se, but when they cross and they breed, we end up with pink flowers. So it's kind of a blending of the two. And this kind of confused scientists for a little while because we were looking at it going, well, that's just a mixture of everything. But we now know that there's different types of dominance out there, and that's what explains it. Okay, 
For our incomplete dominance, what we would do is quite simply plug in everything here. Notice we have our W's and our R's. Let me put the red in first. So we'll put our reds here, and then we'll add in our W's. And what do we notice? 50% of them are going to be white in color. 50% of the offspring are going to be pink in color. Okay, so that's if I crossed a pink and a white. If I crossed a red and a white, they would be all pink. Okay, if I crossed two pink flowers, what would we end up with? One red, two pinks, one white. Okay, and you can play with the Punnett squares later and figure that out I'll show it to yourself if you'd like. Okay, we can also have codominance. Okay, when both alleles are expressed in the heterozygous. So, incomplete dominance is kind of like a mixture. Codominance means both conditions are going to be shown example of that is going to be in cow colors okay so I can have a brown cow which is going to be big B big B I can have a white cow which is going to be big W big W and then we can have what we call Roan and Roan is kind of shows both brown and the white inside of it and that's going to be that heterozygous condition okay our codominant one we take a look at this one here we can fill in our capital B's going down our capital B going across and then finally put in our capital W in, we notice we have what? One out of four is going to be brown, one out of four is going to be white, and two out of four are going to be that Roan condition. And that gives us our 25 to 50 to 25 percent, or it'll be a one to two to one ratio. Okay? Okay, one other type of inheritance is what we call multiple alleles, and that's where we're going to have a gene that has three or more variations. So for up to this point, we've been talking about two variations. It's either going to be this or this, and it could be dominant recessive or codominant or incomplete dominant. But now what we're talking about is multiple alleles. And human blood type shows dominance that way. And what we have is we have type A, we have a type B, and then we have this type O. Okay, so there's three different possible alleles that you can have for blood type. And you're only going to get two of them, one from mom and one from dad. So... You can't have all three. It doesn't work out that way. All right, so what we can do is we can kind of take a look here, and if let's say that your mom is type A and your dad is type B, then you'll be probably type AB. That's how it works out there, okay? Um, and that's the allele that you get from your parents, okay? And it can work out a little bit differently. We can kind of see how it goes. Um, you can see that... Our genotype and phenotype are all marked in there in the chart if you want to look at it. Notice I can be type A if I am homozygous for A or heterozygous with the AO. All right, so it kind of shows a little bit of a difference. There's different variations that are out there. Okay, we can also have what we call sex linked genes and traits, and that means that it's on these sex chromosomes. Okay, if you recall back, we have one pair that determines the sex, that's our X and our Y chromosome. Okay, and the X chromosome tends to have more information to it. It's a larger chromosome, so then there's some traits that are going to be on that X chromosome. Okay, and if it comes that way, you get that X chromosome from your mother. The only way you get a Y chromosome would be from your father, and it would be lacking. So in a female, she might have two genes for that one, or two alleles for that gene, I'm sorry. But for your, if you're a boy, then you might only have that one that came from your mother. Call those sex link traits. And here we can kind of see the difference. Here we see the XY of the male. And notice that the Y is a lot smaller than the XX here in the female. And you can kind of see the variation and the difference in the size. All right. So some examples. In fruit flies, the gene for eye color is on the X chromosome. So red is going to be dominant, while white is going to be recessive. To have white eye as a female must have a homozygous recessive condition for the white allele. Okay? To have white eyes, the male only has to have one because the Y chromosome doesn't have it. Okay? So males are going to have more chance of being a white eyed because they don't need to have two chromosomes to show it. They only need to have one or two alleles to show it. I'm sorry. Okay? So it makes it a little bit more prominent in males. And there's other diseases and other conditions that kind of work out that way as well. So if we do our sex-linked Punnett square here, the bottom part's filled out. Notice that what we start off with, okay, is we'll put in the X's, okay? 
So I put the x's in there, the x's in there, and then I'm going to put in my y, and then I can label what these are. So this is going to be a capital R, this is going to be a capital R, this is a lowercase r, and the y has nothing. Okay, and that'll give us our idea of how to fill it out from there. And then we can do our ratios just as you see here on the slide. Okay, our final type of inheritance is what we're going to call polygenic inheritance. And this is where our traits are controlled by more than one gene. Most of your traits are going to be this way. Okay, so like height isn't just one gene. There's several genes that are going to determine your height. Um, Skin color is going to be another one, eye color is going to be another one, hair color is going to be another one, and that's why we have so much variation. Okay, if we only had one gene, we'd have tall people and we'd have short people. That's it. Okay, we might have medium people if it was co-dominant, but, you know, we'll see how it goes. But we don't. We have a great variation, and the reason for that is because some of these things are so complex that one gene wouldn't be enough to control it. Okay, so that's it for... Our lesson in genetics, hopefully you got it here. All the information's in your lesson, so you still have to kind of go through and do those. I just kind of wanted to give you a real quick, brief update and show and tell you what everything was. Thanks for listening.